in a world as unequal as this one, it's always working class communities and those in poverty that suffer the brunt of decisions taken by those in power. Once thriving communities in Glasgow, like Partick and Govan, are now at risk of being underwater by 2050, the town we are in just now, Clydebank, once a thriving working class community, is also at risk of flooding. Unite Hospitality are standing shoulder to shoulder with these communities in their struggle against being left behind by those in power. Through this conference, we hope to display just how our organising tactics have made Unite Hospitality Glasgow one of the biggest branches in Europe and how the skills that we use can be applied to the struggle against climate change and promote a just transition for all workers. Issues such as climate change might seem separate to our workplaces and hospitality and services, but I think unions can be and should be driving the change for real solutions to tackle climate catastrophe. We can actually create an optimistic alternative um, out of fighting for an actual just society. We knew long ago that if we dug up fossil fuels and we burned them, they would trap more heat in the atmosphere. We knew it would destabilize our climate that it would reduce food production and wipe out plant and animal species. What we didn't know was that the changes would happen so fast. Over the last 160,000 years, there were two ice ages and two warm periods, including the one that we're in now. Now, the change in ice age conditions where you had half a mile thick ice sheets sitting where you are now to the current warm period was just 100 parts per million in carbon dioxide concentrations. Today, we are now at around 413 parts per million and it grows every year. Capitalism creates climate change. 100 companies have been responsible for 70% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions since 1988. The world's richest 1% produce twice as many carbon emissions as the world's poorest 50. told to change while well, their system of capitalism, of for-profit production, stays intact. A system that is not only destroying our environment and destabilizing our climate, but also one that was built off brutal colonization, slavery, dispossession, and oppression, all of which continues today. And that's why climate activists demand system change and climate justice. It's why we say that to deal with the climate crisis, we also have to deal with all the other problems that we are faced with, from housing, transport and education, to racism, sexism, ableism, homophobia and transphobia. Everything has to change about how we get around, how we make the stuff we need, and how we live. What do you want? Climate justice! What do you want it now? What do we want? Climate justice! When do we want this? Now! The same system which ensures that young people are pinned down and paid 4 65 an hour. The same system which fires and rehires people across this country, that steals tips and which wages war on precarious workers in the gig economy. That's what we mean when we call for solidarity between the labour movement and the climate movement. And hospitality, obviously, um, during the pandemic, um, so many like redundancies. My company tried to make 95% of the workforce redundant. We collectivised in our workplace to prevent the redundancies and manage to hold them off for a good few months and get people more far low. But now it's building bigger campaigns, including things like paid transport home um, after midnight, a real living wage, and um, like 100% tips policy, which we've had a massive win on recently as well. COP brings together the figureheads of global capitalism and neocolonialism. In fact, the largest delegation at COP26 is the fossil fuel lobby. They've got 500 people. We've seen the amount of wealth that's poured into Glasgow during COP26, but none of that has been felt by the workers throughout the city. Some branch members have been treated incredibly badly by some delegates, which further exasperates an already overworked, drained workforce throughout COP26 coming off the back of an incredibly stressful experience for people over COVID being frontline workers. As COP26 drew near, Glasgow's industrial front began to mobilise. At one point it looked like we were going to have no trains, no cleansing workers and potentially no buses. And we saw that as a 
real opportunity to try and build a material link between the labour movement and the climate movement. Connecting our shared struggles against exploitation, whether that be exploitation of labour or of our planet's finite resources. On Friday, on the day of our big march, GMB and the cleansing workers joined us. I didn't think uh, I'd ever be a part of this, but I'm, I'm proud to be here today. Uh, and I'm proud that these people have made this banner for us, because the support we have had uh, in the last week has been tremendous. On Friday and Saturday, we mobilised 150,000 people from unions to indigenous communities. We platformed those from the most affected people in areas. That's what we have the power to do when we unite our struggles. The COP Coalition 26 March, a group of protesters were essentially targeted by the police, kettled or cordoned off. You know, it felt like our right to peaceful assembly was being targeted. And it emphasised this need for us to increase this collaboration within trade unions and organisations outside of that. Let them go! 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 We demand a system that prioritises human need not profits for the big corporations. We want a society that makes our lives better and easier. A just transition that puts workers' rights absolutely at the center of the new model. Many of the industries that we have membership will have to change. And we have to take responsibility for that as trade unions. In the tourism sector, we know, for instance, that aviation has a very direct impact on the climate. It's our membership in agriculture, that's very much at the front line of the crisis. If plantations are destroyed, the male workers stay on to restore the plantation. The women who were working in the pack house are all laid off because there's no bananas to pack. In the tea industry, the tea bushes, because of the increase in heat, are not giving as many leaves. The workers, and it's nearly 80, 85% women, can't pick as many tea leaves. Their wages are decreasing. Every year, agricultural workers die from dehydration, chronic renal failure that's really affecting sugarcane workers. It's the damage caused to kidneys by workers in too hot environments for too long. Often no access to potable water in their workplace. That's something that we need to think about in hospitality as well. In some countries, people are being asked to do very heavy jobs in a climate that's very hot. I think also it's important that we do talk about COVID in this meeting. Recovery has to be built on decent work in the sector and a sector that respects the planet. One of the theories is that it came from animals and the destruction of habitat is going to release more and more of those viruses. Arguing for a model of food production that respects the planet and respects workers has to be at the centre of any campaign for climate justice. The Lucas Ennis based Combine Shop Stewards Committee was formed in the late 60s. The combine represented 17 factories, over 14 geographical sites, with 18,000 members and nine trade unions. The combine was consolidated by the success of a strike in the Burnley plants in the UK in the late 60s and early 70s. Jobs were being lost at an alarming rate. The combine decided to draw up an alternative to the company's corporate plan, a plan to save jobs by making products to fulfil the unmet needs of society. We sent out a questionnaire to all our colleagues asking them to come up with product ideas and we had 150 product ideas come back. Designs for wind turbines, heat pumps, solar energy initiatives, hybrid cars, electric cars, road rail vehicles were all part of an integrated transport system. We had a section in the plan for medical equipment which included portable kidney dialysis machines and redesigns for iron lungs. Oceanics such as submersibles for exploring the seabed and the list went on. We insisted the methods of manufacture we should also ensure our members' skills were developed and maintained, including apprenticeships and a call for more female engineers. The Financial Times described the Lucas plan as one of the most radical alternative plans ever drawn up by workers for their company. The workers, supported by academics, were proven right. The management and the Labour government and many of the trade union establishments were wrong. They rejected the plan that products such as hybrid engines, wind turbines, solar technology, heat pumps, all commonplace now and largely manufactured overseas. 
Unite members in GKN this year have done the same thing, where they've created a plan themselves about moving from the production they are to a environmentally sustainable production, and they've created that plan alongside the union, and I think this is where we need to go within every industry, including hospitality. In the Green New Deal workshop, we were talking about um, radical changes that we can we can make across our industry. Works councils is one example, and actually having workers at the heart of the business. I work at the SEC, where COP is being held, one of the largest hospitality workplaces in Scotland. What we have is the Compass UK and Ireland Works Council. The fact that I hadn't heard of it in the place that I've worked for eight years now speaks volumes. And as far as I'm aware, the SEC did not have a representative until now. We're looking at securing the real living wage for staff and also bearing to engage with real union access um, across the venue. And hopefully the beginning of the end of zero hour contracts. That's not to say that like a Works Council format is is the answer to everything. I am still pretty sceptical. You know, the, the real power lies with the workers that are, that are on the ground, that are in the workplace, that are coming together. Not changing your towels, not changing your sheets, not having your room cleaned. All of these are claims that the big hotel chains are making, claiming to customers that they're defending the planet. But we all know that this is just greenwashing. Before, we used to clean the rooms every day, and now, they only call us to clean the checkout rooms. We need to wait for a call and see whether they need us or not. That's not fair. We do not have a schedule. As the climate is changing, things are becoming tougher to source, tougher to afford as well. So it's, it's, we can't be living on such small wages anymore. That lack of security, you don't have a secure wage and you also don't have much security in your housing situation either. In line with that, we're in discussions to become an affiliate to Living Rent, Scotland's tenants union, in line with other affiliates such as the GMB cleansing workers. So there's huge potential there to share our skill sets and our resources and fight for a fair hospitality city and a fair society as a whole. The Fair Work Convention is made up of trade unions and employers and local authorities. We are doing a hospitality inquiry to expose the inequalities, the unfairness and all the, the zero hour contracts, uh, poverty pay etc that um, you know hospitality workers suffer and then you know look to how can we make it better. Also we're here to talk about the Fair Hospitality Charter, a real living wage regardless of age, paid rest breaks, paid transport past 12 a.m., no unpaid trial shifts, proactive sexual harassment policy, minimum hour contracts, consultation on rota changes, one week in advance, 100% tips, trade union access agreements. No justice! No peace! No justice! No peace! No justice! No peace! No justice! No peace! I've been with the company for five years and I've seen how very slowly they strip back different types of benefits that you have with working with the company. Clocking back on time, the unpaid trial shift, there wasn't any intention for welfare as well, working late hours, long hours. In 2018, we started the new year to find out that we were going to have 40% of our car tips cut. Active as of the Monday after finding out on Friday. Tips are so important is because it it can be like 50% on top of your own wages, which are minimum wage. So we unionised. Um, that was the first time actually I ever encountered what a union was and could feel what benefit that they could bring us as well and the voice that they could provide us with. We approached Unite the Union and we found that actually there'd been a campaign running for a number of years around this and this is practiced across the hospitality industry. We went on strike, we had picket lines in London and Manchester and Milton Keynes and other places. We also worked closely with Weatherspoons and Muck Strikers, with Uber Eats because we were all suffering these difficulties and eventually we managed to pass the law. We were heard by the government which was absolutely incredible. It's taken a while but as of this year yeah, in hospitality in general, they can no longer take tips from waiting staff. We have to fight so that we get work. Every day, the company is trying to reduce our hours and they try to overload us with work. We had 40 rooms per person, 37 checked out rooms and seven occupied rooms. The person died after doing all that work. Luckily, we managed to create a union. We got together, we showed how sick and tired we were of them from crushing us. And that's why today we have a good contract with 16 rooms. If anybody's afraid of joining a union, 
please do not be afraid. This is the protection we have as workers. What do we want? Say home. What do we want? Now. What do we want? Say home. What do we want? Now. We're here on South France Central, which is the Intercontinental Hotel Group's flagship hotel in Glasgow, because this is a multi-billion pound hotel chain that still refuses to pay for staff transport home after midnight. One of our members was sexually assaulted walking home three months ago because this company promised that they would pay for a taxi home and they didn't deliver on that promise. So we are here to send a message to one of the biggest hotel groups in the country. The bare minimum that you should be doing is paying for transport home paying the real living wage of £10 an hour and get rid of zero hour contracts. In some cases they are being paid £6.50 an hour and they're not even getting the hours that they need to live. They promised during the Olympics to become the first company in the hotel sector to pay the living wage. This was 10 years ago. Do they pay the living wage? No, they don't. A company like IHG can afford to pay for the transport of the workers that make them their profits. During the pandemic, they still made £660 million. Even though their hotels were shut, they chose to make 95% of the workforce and they are redundant. We need companies like IHG to realise that workers' safety extends out of the workplace and it entails us to tax these home. Hey, hey, IHG, get the workers home for free. Nine out of 10 hospitality staff have experienced sexual harassment at work and 50% of them say that the perpetrator were clients and customers. In Chicago, 58% of the hotel workers and 77% of the casino workers have been sexually harassed by a guest. 49% of the housekeepers had a guest expose themselves or flash them. In Cambodia, workers have been physically assaulted, sexually harassed, and had hot drinks thrown in their face. And the worst part is that uh, there is no consequences for the abusive uh, customers and that management uh, told the workers that nothing can be done, that it's part of the job, and that the workers should apologize. In Norway, we made a campaign together with all these institutions called Draw the Line. We need to set up some standard operating procedures. How do we deal with it? How to report it? How to follow it up? And violation has to have a consequence, has to lead to a consequence. On June 2019, Convention 190 and Recommendation 206 were adopted by the international labour community made of ILO member states, the UK for instance, the workers and employers uh, organisation. It's up to the employer to make sure that the workplace is safe for everybody and not to exclude women from working at night, for instance, because it's too dangerous for them. Article 9 of the Convention requires employers to negotiate with trade unions a workplace policy on violence and harassment. So far, the AF has signed seven agreements in the hotel sector. There are three of them, Accor Invest, Media and Reu. One of the things that we've done on the Works Council is implement the Dignity at Work campaign, or training should I say, which will be rolled out across all campus venues, which looks at um, sexual harassment, bullying, um, and has a formal complaints procedure, for which I think we can all agree is the absolute baseline for what we should be expecting um, from an employer. I'm too tired to fucking smile, pal. Feet blistered and throbbing for some fucking time, pal. Paper cut stinging from chopping fucking limes, pal. And yet you slur. Where's your fucking smile, gal? I'll, you know fucking what? I'll tell you where it is, pal. I left it on my break eating food. I had to pay for, pal. I left it on my plate. The last of eight for hours, pal. And yet you slur. Where's your fucking smile, gal? I smile when staff think my sexuality means I want to rate girls out of ten. These dudes sneer and snigger, I squirm in discomfort yet again. But that's just life in it, don't want to be a moany bitch, so here's my fucking smile there, but flickering like a glitch, oh shit. I can hear sniggers from that cluster, avoid, avoid, avoid with all the energy you can muster. Hey pretty lady, I like the way you're built. Smile, smile, forget your embarrassment, your guilt. My son thinks you're a gorgeous hen, just take the compliment and go. Pretend their eyes don't follow you, do your job, don't put on a show. And so.
I'm too tired to fucking smile, pal, because I do it all day and all fucking night, pal, and you, you might not be the worst of them, but my patience wears so thin, pal, and yet you slur. Where's your fucking smile, gal? Thank you. We can only rely on ourselves, our organizations, and our trade unions. And the sooner we realize that, the better. Climate justice here and globally won't happen unless workers make it happen. And we do that the way we always have, with mass demonstrations, strikes, and civil disobedience to shut their system down.